You are listening to the Pencil and Paper Podcast Network. I'm Katrina, and I love anime. I'm Steven, and I'm aware of anime. But what if that affection could rub off? Perhaps that excitement in her eyes got me curious. I could offer up some solid anime. I could give them a watch, just to see what all the fuss is about. And maybe, just maybe... I could learn to love anime, too. Welcome to Inspired by a Weeaboo. Welcome back, my little weebs. You are back with Inspired by a Weeaboo. I am your host, Katrina, and with me is my husband, Steven. Hello, hello. We just finished episode two of Fully Cooly. And what did you think? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Still chaos. Still chaos, because I feel like... So I did try to have more perspective this time around, and uh, I do have some questions. So I'm I'm <laughs> hoping that that maybe things will start to kind of uh, become more clear as I, I see more episodes. But uh, my God, uh, it bounces all over the place. And that's that's what I, I mean by chaos, because it just seems like the episode is bouncing from one thing to another to another. Hopefully I can try to understand it as we go along. So uh, first and foremost, uh, all right, let me let me just start with questions. For starters, there's an iron in the town, or at least there's this <laughs> giant iron that seems to be prevalent. And I was going to ask about it in the first episode and forgot about it because it just it didn't seem to have a purpose and I'm not saying it it proved any kind of purpose here, but there was some symbolism that seemed to be uh, present. It's at least at one point where he was looking at, um, I can't remember her name, the, the, the girlfriend of, of his brother. He, she was, she was in the, the, the river and saw the shoe floating down. And then Mm -hmm. she was just kind of there and I'm assuming in that moment what was happening because he kind of stared at her and there was just like this, he kind of locked, I don't know, really say he locked eyes with her, but he is like he was just taken aback by her. Mm-hmm. Like you could kind of get that he was being enchanted by her beauty and like he was just kind of feeling things he'd never felt before. And then they showed the iron just kind of blowing up steam. So you kind of get this, symbolism that it's like this steamy kind of red hot passion like <laughs> you know brewing inside of him so I, I i get that uh aspect of it at least that's what i'm kind of taking away from it there was a lot of um <laughs> how to put this perversion in this episode because there was a, a moment and again, this could be taken however people want to take it. But mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> there was just this one shot uh, from behind said girlfriend whose name, again, I cannot remember. Um, I'm sorry. I can't remember. I'm sure <laughs> we have we have cell phones. We have Google. We could we could do this. Uh, Haruko or is it Mana- no, uh, it's Mamimi? The, yeah, Mamimi. Okay. So Mamimi is... Standing looking at, I guess, fire. Mm -hmm. No, no. She was looking at the robot who was doing some angelic dive off of a (laughs) building, which we'll get to. And, you know, the wind was briskly flowing and her Mm -hmm. skirt kept. And we saw her back end through the wind blowing. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, all right, I guess that's something. And then there was that really pervy guy who was looking at her, uh, the other girl's Vespa, whose name I said, and I've already forgotten. God damn. Haruko? Uh, Haruko. I guess her, her Vespa had, had been damaged. And this guy was like looking at it. like, oh, I don't understand what this is. This doesn't look normal. And he was looking under her skirt. Mm-hmm. like, And I was like, all right, all right, that's what we're doing here. So... <laughs> And like I said, the perviness of it was just kind of prevalent because even they mentioned like the robot was in the store looking at Hustler magazines, who was apparently shopping for the grandfather, yeah. <laughs> uh, getting Hustler magazines because he liked Dan and Nicole Smith 
you know, who, you know, hey, I, I get that. <laughs> you know, I was there. I, I got it. Um, so I was trying to, with with these elements in place, mm-hmm. trying to understand the robot now. Because I don't understand the angelic thing. <laughs> you know, him diving off, getting the wings and whatnot and having the halo now. But I'm assuming because even, um, God damn, the, the main kid, not, not, I want to call him Naruto for <laughs> now, now toe, not, nota, God nota. damn it. Okay. Now, nota, nota. For some reason, I'm going to say nota, <laughs> nota. He, he has more horns coming out and it happens mm-hmm. at a very specific moment where it almost seemed like he was having emotional conflict Mm -hmm. where he saw the girlfriend. I'm just going to call her the girlfriend. Please forgive me. Mami, Mami, Mami. She goes to call her Mimi. (laughs) All right, Mimi. She goes to kiss the robot. Mm -hmm. And that's when Nota has his his next horn transformation and this other giant robot comes out. So I'm assuming after seeing that, that's saying that he's having this conflict, this emotional conflict. And that's what triggers these releases of these robots, you know, and then they, they clash with one another trying to figure out where he stands with his feelings toward Mimi. I mean, I always, I would definitely say that's on the right track. I always looked at the robots as the very first one. Like, even when it came out of his head, when you watch it, like, he's already grappling with another, like, the arm that came out with him. So I always viewed each robot as it's a different emotion or feeling that he has. Okay. It's just... How they they lay it all out because we go there. There was even this this other thing that I noticed, and I just found it odd because I mentioned the artistic vision that the that the artists have mm-hmm. and how they use different con, kinds of um, animation styles. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning, when they were like the main three characters are just loafing about around the house, and the animation was just so liquid i guess Mm because they just look so frumpy and and just weird and it was just it was (laughs) such a one-off thing that they did Uh, like and that weird cat (laughs) that just pops up out of nowhere (laughs) has this really weird kind of animation style that does not mesh with everything else but it kind of does but it seems to be more on the frumpy side and you know what i'm talking about if you saw what i'm if you've seen this episode and you know what i'm talking about in that Mm -hmm. scene they just they looked off you know, well, and even like with the cat, I don't know if you've picked up on it, but not that I ever remember. It has not been explained, but um, there's a lot more, it seems, that's going on with the cat. OK, and, and that could be something in subsequent se- or seasons that we don't we don't know about. Possibly or in the or in the manga. OK, so it, I don't know. It's it's. I know I keep saying chaos. <laughs> and it, that's that's really the only way I can... Because they, they bounce from narrative to narrative. They rent the house. They were talking about the Hustler magazines. Mm-hmm. And then they bounce to the bridge. And then he's with his school friends. And then they see Mimi sitting in the river. And they're t- they're talking about arson of the school. And then we go to her. And it, they, they bounce to all these elements so fast that it's hard to kind of keep up. But it has a... Co- it- Even though they bounce with it, it's funny because I'm able to follow it. And maybe it's because I've seen it so many times. But it's it's like the little breadcrumbs. Because if you, like through the episode, you know, they're talking about the arson Mm -hmm. and everything. And nobody knows who's doing it. And nobody knows, you know, why it's happening, blah, blah, blah. And then it comes down to Nato being the one that figures it out. And it was the Mimi girl who had been doing it this Which entire I, time. I, yeah, I kind of <laughs> figured that's that's who the arsonist was. So was she still setting fires? Did I understand that yes. correctly? So she's the one that set fire to the school. 
And then... Um, I don't know if it's ever um, concrete that she set the uh, first fire, the one where um, Nato's brother so rescued could it, him. So could it have been the brother? We think? No. Maybe? no. I think okay. that it was just an accident and ah. she had this kind of like... Um, we call it like she held his brother up on a pedestal because he saved her. Gotcha. So she had this love and infatuation that continued. They seem to have had a relationship because even Nato makes the comment that grandfather never wanted her dating, you know, his brother. Right. So they had a relationship at some point and then he leaves and she's a very disturbed girl. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, it's. <clears throat> She seems like she's a little flighty, like there's something going on there in her head that you're mm -hmm. not quite 100% sure about. And then, obviously, if she's an arsonist, she's got some other emotional baggage that I don't know if they're going to explain. But And it's all because of the video game. Yeah. That's the what? other thing. It was that video game that she was playing where she got the idea. Aptly and then when Firestarter. she saw... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then I feel like when she saw the robot in the angelical form, it almost con like made it concrete for her. Gotcha. But what is that all about? <laughs> like, why? Why was the robot going doing this angelic thing? Like, what is that about? Because that feels like I think that it's just the whole like the whole gag where he keeps going out and Nato keeps trying to keep him at home because every time he goes out, it like sets off a series of events. Well, this okay. set off a series of events. But that still relates back to Nato, and that's where I'm confused, mm -hmm. because if that's an emotion of Nato's at, at some point, or is is that he's he's kept bottled up and is now free, what is that entailing to her in, in, a, in a more metaphorical state? You know, it, there's something like, like I'm, I'm feel I feel like I'm missing a, 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 an element to help me understand this clearer. I feel like his original robot, when it's in his blue form, I feel like it's almost like his child self. Because if you notice, although Nato is a 12 year old boy, he does not act like a 12 year old boy. He doesn't go out and play. Mm -hmm. Even when he's hanging out with his friends, they're not necessarily playing and he looks miserable the entire time. And he constantly gets irritated when it comes to adults not acting like adults. So he is this child who feels like he has to act like an adult. And I feel like the robot represents several things because one, I feel like it definitely represents his like childhood innocence. Okay. That's why it runs around. That's why it's happy and does things and just a very sweet soul. And then when it goes red... I almost feel like that's, I guess you could call it almost his inner warrior, but it's also kind of like his love because he protects the people he loves when that happens. Right. And we did get clarification in this episode about the uh, one girl's age, the... Um, Mimi. Not Mimi, the other one. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Haruko. Haruko, is that she, she did say 19. She was 19 yes. years old. Like, that came straight from her mouth. So, we've got that concrete. She's 19. But so. honestly, can we trust her? That's true. That's true. <laughs> she does seem like a shady character. Ran over the kid yet again with her Vespa. Uh, of course, he was thrown into the Vespa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Thrown in, ran over, pooped out. I mean, he that poor child, he just gets put through the ringer. He does. So, hmm. I'm trying to understand this. I'm trying to get more of a, uh, a, a connection, understanding with the elements that I have. And and I don't know if I would have made that connection. And I don't want to say like, I'm, I'm, I'm not stupid. <laughs> you know, I do want people to understand that. I do get metaphors with a lot of things, but this one, I mean, it's just, Wow, the 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 chaotic nature of the show is what's difficult for me to kind of latch on to certain elements, and and I think that's why I've had I had difficulty originally, and I'm still having difficulty now, even though I'm trying to process it with those ideas in mind and try to try to see the metaphors. Yeah, 
because I honestly feel like that's what the show is. It's a, it's a series of metaphors done in this very chaotic manner. And if I can come up with a better word than chaotic, I will. But right now, that's all I got. But um, I will say that's, like I've said before, that's one of the things I love about it. Because at the surface, like if you showed this to somebody, like the first time I showed it to you, they're most likely going to see it and just go, what the crap is that? This is stupid. It's juvenile. You know, something, not that you said that, but you know what I no, mean? Like, yeah. I feel like it would be, you would show it to somebody and be like, watch this and let me know what you think. And then they'd be like, oh my God, it's just juvenile. It's stupid. It's, you know, I not would, coherent. <laughs> yeah, no, I never really felt it was juvenile. It, it just felt incoherent. Like there was some, there was an element I was missing somewhere and I was like, what, what is it that I'm missing? Because I, I could tell that they were trying to say something from a metaphorical perspective, but I, I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Because it's, it's so deeply hidden. And that's what I love about it. Because it's like it is deeply hidden, but once you know what it is you're looking for, I feel like you see it so much more. And it makes you look at each part and each scene differently because you're looking for those little connections as to what that episode's about. Yeah. Yeah. Now, exp- you you kind of we glossed over it. Explain the iron. Do they do they it's, ever really <clears throat> kind of go into detail they or, or do explain more about it? All right, um, so don't from, go into too much detail then. No, but just from the first episode, uh, Nato says that it is um, the Mecha Mechanica, and it's a factory or hmm. a power plant. And when it came to the town. Everybody was excited because they thought, you know, it'd bring in, you know, they would prosper. Sure. Basically. And from like what Nato said, nothing ever happens. Every day's the same. Nothing amazing happens. It's just a boring town. Mm-hmm. And now you start to see the kind of correlations between every time Nato has one of his attacks. And the robots come out versus what's happening with the factory because either it starts blowing the steam or it lights up or there's sirens going off. And every time that happens, if you pay attention to Haruko's uh, cufflink, Mm -hmm. it will start rattling almost like it's a like a. It's being attracted to something. Right. Now, I did kind of notice that. So I'm assuming that has some element to do with her. And is it like what she is or is there more to it? It has to do with her and what's coming out of Nato's head and with uh, the Mechanica. Okay. So. Like it's all like a nice little triangle. It all kind of goes together. All right. So I'm again, I'm not crapping out of this when I mean the fact that we're recording (laughs) Means that I'm in for the long haul, so I'm in for every episode. So, um, I mean, we'll just continue on, and and maybe maybe there are maybe by the end of it, I'll I'll get it. That's that's at least my hope is that by mm-hmm. the time from from where I'm at now to by the time we reach episode six, I'll be like, dude, I get it, I got it, it's fantastic. I can look back at all the episodes and be like, I understand all the details, but right now. It's still just a hodgepodge of just scenes and and ideas that I just don't fully grasp yet. I can tell you right now, um, I am going to bet that you will still be confused just because I feel like a lot of even fans are still confused as to the ending. And that's why people were so excited when the season two got announced (laughs) because nobody knew what the crap was happening. And I don't want to dismiss it. You know, I I Mm -hmm. don't want to think that I I can't understand it because it's I I feel like I can understand things on such a level sometimes that it, it really kind of. You know, I can understand metaphors. I can understand these subtle messages that that certain filmmakers and writers and and such are trying to make. That I it's I get it. You know, I I do get these things. I mean, mm-hmm. 
not to go off on uh, uh, too much of a tangent on another podcast that we did, you know, if you want to go listen to that. <laughs> but we we discussed Halloween Ends, and that was a very divisive film. But I felt like we understood what the filmmakers were attempting to do. And that again, that's not to dismiss what other people saw. Those people that didn't like it, they had expectations. They had they had visions. They had ideas of what they assumed the film was going to be, and it just wasn't that. And I don't have any expectations for Fooly Cooly. I don't know what this is other than just an anime that my wife is showing me. So I have no preconceived notions as to what this is supposed to be, but. So I feel like I should try to understand it better. And and when I can't really grasp it, even with some clear understanding, it's, it frustrates me because I'm like, what am I missing? What is the element that, that's missing for my brain to comprehend what they are trying to say? Because I, I appreciate that. I do appreciate some deep, thoughtful, introspective to these ideas and they're not just blatantly out there, you know. I, th- I yeah. feel like it's more fascinating. One of my most, I mean, one of my favorite movies mm-hmm. uh, that I feel like does that wonderfully is Planet of the Apes, the original 1968 version, because it's the whole thing is a metaphor of the current times of the United States at that moment, you know, yeah. the racism and, and uh, military uh, conflicts and just everything. Yeah. It's such a metaphor for the time. And it's wonderfully done. Mm-hmm. But I guess maybe it's just too they do it in such a simplistic way <laughs> that that it's just easier for me to understand. This it seems so deep and I want to appreciate it, but I'm I'm having <laughs> trouble. I mean, it's okay. I mean, I feel like if there's anything people can take away from fully coolly even if you don't get you know the deeper meanings or anything like that the music yeah music is 100 percent. the music is some of the best music in the last episode that we watched episode two the song that they played towards the end with the fight scene is my absolute favorite song Versus the one that they play towards the end. And mm-hmm. it might be the same song. I can't remember. It's been a while since I watched Fully Cooly. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I have the music on my regular playlist for my YouTube music. And I just, their music is amazing. Yeah. I From mean, opening to ending everything. I absolutely love any of the music in Fully Cooly. And I really hope season two does it justice. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I can agree with that. The music is is pretty bumping, so. <laughs> yeah. Pretty bumping. All right, so we can hop into episode three if you want to. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we're going to get into episode three. Steven, tell everyone where they can find us. Well, you can find Inspired by Weeboo on all your preferred podcasting platforms. Tell all your friends they can find you there. And if you want to make it easier for yourself, go to PencilPaperProductions.com slash Inspired Weeaboo. And you can find everything there. Hopefully we'll be on some social medias uh, very soon whenever we figure out where we want to be at. But until then, just uh, follow us on the, the website. All links will be posted down below in the show notes. All right, my little weebs, we'll see you next time. This has been a Pencil and Paper Podcast Network production.